and welcome to the Richmond Gallery of the Eden Woolley House, home of the Ocean Township Historical Museum. We're here today on Wednesday, March 25th, 2020, to provide a virtual tour of our current exhibit, Votes for Women, New Jersey and Beyond. It's the story of the fight for the 19th Amendment. It's 2020. Uh, the 19th Amendment was ratified in August of 1920, so we're celebrating the 100th anniversary. When we start to talk about the fight for women's suffrage, it's really important to put it in the context of what it was like for women in this country in the 19th century. The start of the movement is usually measured by the Seneca Falls, New York Women's Rights Convention in 1848. It was not the first time that women had spoken up in defense of their rights and, and in defense of their right to vote, but it was the start of an organized movement, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But let's talk first about what it was like to be a woman in the 1800s in this country, especially a married woman. If you were a woman and married, you gave up your rights as a legal citizen. That included giving over all of your property, whether it was earned income or inherited wealth or property, to your husband. And that wealth was truly his. It didn't revert to you in the event of his death. Even your children were not automatically in your custody if your husband should die and you were widowed. You had no rights in court. You could not sign legal documents. You could not testify. And by custom, if not by law, women in the 19th century, at least until the later years of the 19th century, were not permitted to speak in public if men were present. So it was an oppressive lot for women. And it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott who met in England at an abolition convention in the uh, 1840s, I think 1840 itself, and were, per and were, were uh, denied the privilege of attending except behind a, a curtain, who were so outraged that they vowed that they were going to do something. It took them eight years, but when they met again in 1848, they and several of their friends decided to organize a convention and put an ad in the paper and invite people who were also distressed by the, by the status of women to convene and, and make a declaration for change. And so they, they announced the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. It's interesting and important to note that it was called the Women's Rights Convention and not the Suffrage Convention. At that time, the middle of the 19th century, suffrage was a truly, suffrage for women was a truly radical idea. So radical that when Elizabeth Cady Stanton introduced it into the demands that were documented by the convention, it was the only of, one of the demands that was not unanimously approved. It was so radical that her husband, who was in attendance and who was a progressive and a supporter of women's rights, was so humiliated by the uh, outrage of such a demand that he left the convention and the story has it that he also left town. It was, interestingly enough, Frederick Douglass, a former slave, an escaped slave, uh, a legendary orator and a woman's rights man who was in t attendance at Seneca Falls, who stood and spoke so eloquently that he turned the tide for the demand for suffrage as such that, though not unanimous, it was passed by the convention. And such was the beginning and the, the triggering event for the women's suffrage movement that took 72 years to its culmination. The most iconic of our American suffragists is Susan B. Anthony. She is on the stamp, she is on the, the Anthony dollar, and she's the one that I think most Americans would think of if you stopped them in the street and said, name an American suffragist. So this friendship and the alliance between Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Elizabeth Cady Stanton being with Lucretia Mott, the, the uh, organizers of the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, Elizabeth and Susan met in 1851, so that was three years after the, the convention. Oh, so Susan B. Anthony was not at the, 19, the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. Um, they were both 
uh, abolitionists, as were many of the early suffragists. And uh, many of the early suffragists learned their leadership skills and their organizing skills fighting for the elimination of, of, of slavery, and many of them also for temperance. So, uh, and that was the case for Susan B. Anthony as well. Susan and Elizabeth met in 1851 and became lifelong friends and formidable allies and devoted their lives, particularly Susan B. Anthony, who never married. And she said, why would anyone marry? Why would any woman marry in this century under the conditions that exist for married women? So she made a vow to never marry. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, on the other hand, did marry, and she was the mother of seven children. So her domestic responsibilities kept her at home, uh, and on many occasions when, when Anthony was the one on the road traveling literally tens of thousands of miles, spreading the word and organizing. Both were masterful organizers and strategists and philosophers and statisticians. They just had a really uh, impressive uh, toolbox of skills and, 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 and gifts. Uh, very often it was Stanton back at home who was strategizing and writing speeches and it was Anthony on the road delivering those speeches and organizing across across the nation. It was not an easy thing. The travel was difficult, the circumstances were difficult, getting the money together to, to support the campaign was difficult, and perhaps the most formidable of all the obstacles was the public ridicule. It was not a popular idea. Suffrage went against the basic belief system of the country at the time, which that was that society was working just fine and would continue to work just fine if everyone just kept their place. And clearly the place for women in the majority of Americans' minds was in the home. And they felt that giving women the right to vote would expose them to the ugly and sullied world of politics, and that it would create expense, that in many cases they would vote as their husbands told them, adding no value, only cost, and disrupting society. So that's what uh, the suffragists were up against. But nonetheless, they persisted in the face of public ridicule, and uh, they mapped out three paths to suffrage. One was to change state by state the individual constitutions. And this was possible because the US Constitution gives the authority to decide and determine and define who can vote to the states. The US Constitution remains mute on that point except to give the authority to the individual states. So a state by state campaign to change constitutions one at a time was undertaken. It was not very efficient. The western states were the first states to allow women to vote. Uh, I think one of the theories is that they were desperate to attract women to the west and said, sure, you want to vote? Vote. Come on out and join us here. Uh, so Wyoming was the first as a territory and later as a state, and then I believe Utah and I think Colorado. But uh, by the turn of the 20th century, there were only three states, all of them Western, that allowed a women suffrage, a universal suffrage. Some states would allow women to vote in school board elections. They thought that was a feminine enough arena for women to uh, cast their, their ballots, but, but nothing else. Uh, some later on allowed them to vote in presidential, but the women, the suffragists, were demanding universal suffrage, and they were demanding it for all women in all states without conditions. So state-by-state state, constitutional change was the very first path that was possible. Um, the second path might have been a federal amendment, a federal amendment overriding the state's authority, saying, yes, as the Constitution, we know that we told the states that you have the right to decide who can vote. But the US Constitution will say that no state nor the federal government can deny a citizen the right to vote based on sex. And that's basically the language of the constitutional amendment that was first introduced by Susan B. Anthony uh, to Congress in 1878. 
Uh, it was at that time, if ratified, would have been the 16th Amendment. As we know, when it was finally ratified, it was the 19th Amendment. So it took 42 years, I believe, if my math is correct, before the initially introduced constitutional amendment was finally passed and ratified by the states. So the second path was to work and lobby and speak and agitate for a federal amendment. That would be a much more efficient way of getting the change in a nationwide, on a nationwide basis. The state-by-state -state strategy and the federal amendment strategy were both executed simultaneously. One of the, one of the thoughts was that one, the more states that gave women the vote, the more states there would be who would help to pass, whose, whose uh, congressional delegations and whose voters would help support a federal amendment so that they were synergistic in that sense. So we have state-by-state -state constitutional change, we have U.S. constitutional amendment, and the third path was through the courts. So there were women in the 19th century, including, including Susan B. Anthony, who voted knowing that their vote would be thrown away and knowing that they would in all probability also be arrested, fined, and perhaps even jailed. And they did it willingly and knowingly. And behind the, their, their actions were the, was the motivation that they would appeal their convictions all the way to the Supreme Court and that they would argue that as U.S. citizens they could not be denied the right to vote as outlined in the 14th Amendment. Susan B. Anthony's case was never got beyond the local level. As it turned out, the story is that her lawyer paid the fine and ended that route for her. This, this was uh, 1872 that Susan B. Anthony cast her vote in a presidential election for U.S. Grant. In the same election, uh, a woman in St. Louis, a, w a woman named Virginia Minor, also attempted to register to vote, and she was arrested. She appealed, and appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, and she argued on the basis of the 14th Amendment that as a citizen she could not be denied the right to vote. The, of course, all-male Supreme Court unanimously disagreed, and her uh, appeal was denied, and, sh and the Supreme Court effectively shut down the courts as a route to suffrage for women. So that left the two constitutional paths, the state-by-state uh, -state constitution and the federal constitution, which the suffragists continued to pursue through the end of the century. But before we leave the century, there was a, a seminal moment, uh, the most catastrophic event in the history of our country, the Civil War. And the Civil War had a, had a profound effect on the suffrage movement and the way it played out uh, through the 20th century and perhaps even till today. We've already talked about the, the relationship between abolition and suffrage. Many, if not most, of the early suffragists both men and women were also ardent abolitionists and fought tirelessly for the uh, uh, end of slavery. So naturally, when the Civil War began, many of the suffragists abandoned the fight for the vote for women and threw all of their energies and resources into supporting the war effort and ending slavery. And this included Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, both of whom tirelessly collected signatures on petitions around the country. The story is that they collected 400,000 signatures on a petition that they delivered to Congress in support of the 13th Amendment ending slavery. One of the senators credited them with being a deciding factor in the passage of the amendment. And Stanton and Anthony believed that their tireless work and their selfless devotion to the end of slavery and the war effort would be rewarded. Specifically, they knew that the 13th Amendment ended slavery. The 13th Amendment was followed by the 14th Amendment, because we have to stop for a minute and think about this. You end slavery and you free millions of, of, of African Americans in this country, and particularly in the South. Who are they now? 
right? They were property until the passage and ratification of the 13th Amendment. How should they be treated now? So the 14th Amendment answers that question. It says that anyone born in this country is a citizen of the United States. So that means that all African American former slaves born in this country immediately become citizens. And the 14th Amendment then goes on to enumerate the rights and, and, and the privileges of US citizens. Unfortunately, for the first time, the 14th Amendment also introduces the word male. Previous to the 14th Amendment, the Constitution and all of its amendments had been silent on gender and sex and no mention of male or female. But the 14th Amendment does mention male. And when, as we have discussed, when uh, Virginia Minor took the 14th Amendment as the foundation of her argument to the Supreme Court that as a woman citizen, she had the right to vote, the Supreme Court denied her appeal. So we, we know that that did not help women. So Anthony and uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and many of the suffragists are dismayed. Then comes the 15th Amendment. So now we have the 13th Amendment that abolishes slavery across the nation. We have the 14th Amendment that defines former slaves and anyone born in this country as a citizen and outlines their rights as citizens. And then we have the 15th Amendment that explicitly says for the first time in our history that the United States Constitution is going to override the authority of the states and put limits on what the states could do in defining or denying the right to vote. And the, the 15th Amendment says that no state nor the federal government can deny a citizen the right to vote based on race. The suffragists had hoped for two more words or sex. They didn't get it. And the aftermath of that was not just disappointment, but outrage, at least on the part of some of the suffragists. And the outraged suffragist included Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who were so infuriated that they refused to support the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Remember now that both of these women were abolitionists. And both of these women had fought tirelessly for the end of slavery. And yet, on record, they have made statements that are painfully racist to our 21st century ears. And uh, their outrage was based on this, this, to them, illogical predicament that former slave males were being given the vote before women. And it was such an indignation to them that their words were to, the, to our ears un unfortunate today, at, at best unfortunate, at worst certainly racist. And so it was such, it was such um, a strongly felt sentiment on the part of Stanton and Anthony that they actually split, they actually split the suffrage movement in half. And there were suffragists like Lucy Stone, whom we'll speak of a little in, in a little while, who continued to support universal suffrage, meaning they, they supported the ratification of the 15th Amendment, giving former male slaves the right to vote, and women. They held both of those ideas simultaneously and fought for both. And then you, on the other hand, you had Stanton and Anthony, who refused to support the 15th Amendment and formed a separate organization. They were funded by a man named Train, who enabled them to publish um, a periodical or a broadside and, and to tour the country giving speeches. But he was a, a well-known racist. So again, the women's suffrage movement was tainted by, by racism at this time. It turns out that Lucy Stone's daughter, a kind of a second generation of suffragists, finally managed to reconcile the differences between the two camps of the women's suffrage movement. The two camps came together and formed one national uh, suffrage movement. And the first president of that movement was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The second was um, Susan B. Anthony. And uh, that was followed by Carrie Chapman Catt, whom we'll also learn a little bit later.
So by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, what you're seeing is a suffrage movement that has been split apart over the question of race and then brought back together. You see the country slowly moving more favorably toward the idea of women's suffrage. You see some of the laws in various states that had so severely curtailed the rights of women easing up and women's plight in society and their legal status improving. But at the same time, you see a waning of the enthusiasm in the movement itself and an aging of the iconic leaders and founders of the movement. Susan B. Anthony died in 1906. Elizabeth Cady Stanton died in 1902. Before she died, Susan B. Anthony became known as Aunt Susan to a new generation of suffragists in this country, and she was tutoring them and inspiring them to carry the torch over the finish line, and as it turned out, of course, they were the ones who did. So we want to talk now about the second wave of the suffrage movement, starting around the turn of the century. And there are a couple of names that are, uh, that are pivotal in understanding what was going on here. I'd like to start with a New Jersey native, born, I believe, in Mount Laurel. Uh, and her, her family home, Paulsdale, is open as a muni museum now. Alice Paul was born here and uh, was a Quaker as were so many of the, of the suffragists. And, and it turns out that for the most part of history, the Quakers have come down on the right side from the abolition of slavery to women's rights to, so many, to peace to so many, other, so many other issues. So Alice Paul, born uh, at the end of the 19th century, I believe 1885, studied in England. Her family was very well educated, and Alice followed in that tradition. She graduated from Swarthmore. She eventually earned degrees, a PhD, and also a law degree. Uh, and for a time, she was studied social work in London. She was studying social work in London in the early 20th century, at a time when the women in London who were fighting for the vote were expressing their demands in much more militant terms than the counterparts in the United States. Just a footnote here. In the United States, the women and men who were fighting for the vote were called suffragists, I-S-T-S. In England, they called themselves suffragettes. Um, it turns out that suffragette was a term that was used to make fun of the suffragists in, in the Great Britain uh, in the papers in 1906, the suffragists adopted it as their own, kind of as a term of, of, of uh, a red badge of courage, so to speak, and took it on with great pride and called themselves suffragists. In this country, suffragists continued to be the preferred term of the people fighting in the movement. Suffragette was used here, but it was used to mock and make front of the suffragists. So when you see literature uh, about suffragettes in this country, it almost always is uh, propaganda or against the suffrage movement. So let's get back to Alice Paul. Alice Paul goes to England to study social work, and she tutors under the um, leadership of the Pankhursts, the family of women in England who led a very militant, meaning they would throw bricks, they would start fires, they would carry on to the point that they were being arrested and being jailed, when in jail, would uh, hold hunger strikes to get more attention from the press, were force-fed as a result of their hunger strikes. And this was the, and Alice Paul joined in with them, was arrested, did refuse to eat, was force-fed. And this was the kind of expectation that Paul had when she returned to this country in 1910, fired up and ready to fight for the vote here. So she joined that organization that we talked about earlier, the melding of the Lucy Stone and the Chapman Anthony organizations into a national organization that was running things, basically, and organizing the suffrage movement here in the earliest 20th century. Paul was appalled. She could not believe how conservative they were and how lacking in, in marketing skills they were. So she joined the organization. She later split away and formed her own 
uh, National Women's Party. But in the early years, she joined the organization, and her first act, or her first splashy act, was to organize a woman's suffrage procession in March of 1913. It was a huge, big deal. It was brilliantly scheduled for the eve of President Wilson's first inaugural in Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue. Alice Paul knew that reporters from all over the country would be in Washington and on the eve of the inauguration, inauguration have nothing to do, so she gave them something to do. They covered this parade. 5,000 plus women from across the country came, paraded with elaborate floats and classical tableaus. The parade organizers asked for protection from the Washington police, which they did not get in sufficient force. And the hecklers along the parade route estimated, the parade crowd estimated to be 100,000, I believe. Uh, not all of them hecklers, but enough of them hecklers that they disrupted the, the procession and put 100 marchers, uh, in, injured 100, 100 marchers. So the reporters were there, they took pictures, they covered it. The story made papers across the nation. It was the story of the parade, it was the story of the harassment, it was the story of the arrests. It was sensational and it was exactly what Alice Paul intended and wanted to give a shot in the arm to the suffrage movement. There's kind of a footnote to this, which is something that Alice Paul didn't want. But as the women came from across the country, a good number of them were African-American women who had been active from the beginning in the suffrage movement, but were not necessarily or even frequently welcomed into the mainstream white suffrage movement. Particularly a woman named I'm sorry, Ida B. Wells from Chicago, who came to Washington intending to march with the Illinois delegation and was told by Paul and the parade organizers that yes, she could march, but march at the end of the parade. Ida B. Wells, whose married name was Barnett, Ida B. Wells Barnett, refused to accept that and marched with her fellow suffragists from Illinois in the mainstream of the parade. And it's just, again, one more example where this legacy of race and, and the shadow of slavery is cast on, on the suffrage movement. And again, I just need to remind us that Alice Paul was a Quaker and spent her life as, as a social justice crusader and, and campaigner, and yet in her history too, there is this, this painful uh, and embarrassing uh, racial chapter. So basically we have two different strategies and two different leaders of the suffrage movement in the early years of the 20th century. You have Alice Paul, her, women, her National Women's Party, and their radical methods. They are focused on a fed, an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. They have very little patience with the state-by-state state slow strategy. And because they're focused on a federal amendment, they are headquartered in Washington, and they are focused directly on influencing the, the support of President Wilson. President Wilson, a Southerner by birth, is a tepid supporter of votes for women, but he is an opponent of a federal amendment. And he says, yeah, the right to vote is determined by the states. It's a state-by-state -state issue. And I basically support that women should be able to vote. Alice Paul was impatient with this. And so she is in Washington. She is confronting Wilson, and she's fighting for an amendment to the US Constitution. At the same time, Car Carrie Chapman Catt has taken over the leadership. Uh, she abandoned it for a while for personal reasons, um, but returned to it later, in the, in, just in the run-up to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. For our purposes, we will call Cat the leader of the more traditional conservative wing of the women's suffrage movement in the 20th century. And Kat is believing that the state-by-state -state strategy is a sound one. She doesn't oppose a federal amendment, but she thinks perhaps the safest, most reliable road to a federal amendment is through enfranchising more women based on state amendments. So you have Paul and Kat as rivals in the movement, and Kat is much more traditional 
in her methods than is uh, Alice Paul. Now, just as in the 19th century, the Civil War intruded into the suffrage movement and had a profound effect, in the early 20th century, we have another war that is going to cast its shadow on the suffrage movement, and that is World War I. So the United States enters World War I in 1917, and the conservative Carrie Chapman Catt-led arm of the suffrage movement says, you know, I think it's disloyal and unpatriotic to continue to campaign for suffrage when the United States is at war. So Catt suspends her, her movement and turns her resources and her organization in support of the war effort. She does things like starting a women's overseas hospital and other things that are meant to show the loyalty and the skills. She has this theory that if she demonstrates to the president and the nation the skill, the intelligence, the resourcefulness, the loyalty, and the patriotism of women, that the country and the president and the Congress will reward those women with the, the passage of the 19th Amendment and then the ratification by the states. So that's kind of her strategy. Alice Paul is buying none of this. She says, you mean to tell me that we are going to send two million American soldiers to Europe and put them in harm's way in the name of democracy, to make the world safe for democracy while we are depriving the vote, that is democracy, to one half of the population of this country. So instead of shutting down her movement, she ramped up her movement. She organized the Silent Sentinels, a group of volunteers from her women, National Women's Party from around the country that picketed the White House, the first instance of picketing the White House in our history. And they never spoke. They carried placards that, that uh, goaded President Wilson into supporting suffrage calling him things like Kaiser Wilson. As he didn't respond, they got more and more blatant and militant and confrontational in their rhetoric on their signs. They, they picketed six days a week, regardless of season, regardless of temperature, regardless of precipitation. And in the beginning, Wilson was amused. He sent his aides with coffee to give, to give them some warmth in the cold winter. However, as the war wore on, so did Wilson's nerves, and he became so impatient that he, I won't say ordered, but certainly encouraged the Washington police to arrest the silent sentinels, the suffragists who were picketing in front of the White House. He was, the women were arrested for obstruction of traffic which was um, obviously a trumped up charge, and sent, and sent off and, and booked and, and put in jail. And the interesting thing is that their arrest went with a fine, and the fine was modest enough. And most of these women were middle class or well-to-do. And they could have easily paid the fine and gotten out of jail, but almost none did. Because the point of being arrested was to get the newspaper coverage and have the stories appear and begin to sway the public opinion who were seeing these well-dressed women who were protesting based on principle being arrested and put in jail for speaking their mind and demanding the vote. And it began to work. And a public opinion was swaying against the president. And when the coverage began to wane, oh, the women went to jail, but they demanded to be treated as political prisoners and not criminals. And when they were refused that status, they refused to eat. And when they refused to eat, Wilson became more and more troubled, thinking these women are getting thinner and weaker, and if one of them dies, this is going to be a public relations nightmare. It had already become a public relations headache. And so... He ordered that their jailers feed them. And so these women who were weakened already by refusing to eat were, were administered this torturous procedure of force feeding in which a tube was put down their nose or their arms. First, they're strapped to a chair. And then liquid nourishment is poured through a funnel through the tube into their stomach. Painful and, and very threatening procedure. 
So as, as the days wore on and, and the coverage became more gruesome, Wilson finally relented and he agreed to personally support the passage in Congress of, this, of, of the 19th Amendment. So just as a quick little civics review here, to pass an amendment, the Congress by two-thirds of both houses has to pass the language and approve the language of the proposed amendment. That being done, the language is then sent to the states and three-quarters of the states, which in 1919 uh, was, in 19, 1920, was 36 different states. And these, the led state legislatures of each of these states then get to choose whether or not to even vote on ratification, and if they vote, to vote it yes or no. So Wilson starts this process in motion by personally supporting it, lobbying Congress, and finally uh, Congress does pass the language and it goes off into the states. So now we arrive at August 1920, and everything boils down to the state of Tennessee. You have had all those states who will ratify, ratify, those who denied, denied, and several of them who refused to see it, to, to, to consider the issue, refused to consider the issue. So all eyes are on Nashville, and all of the suffragists from around the country, their leaders are there. And the anti-suffragists, those who are opposing votes for women, are there. The press is there from around the country. And the, the, the Tennessee legislature is meeting in the heat of a southern su summer to consider the question of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The stakes are very high. A yes vote for ratification makes votes for women the law of the land. A no vote basically closes it down for at least this session of, of Congress. And, they have to, and the suffragist movement needs to start all over again. So as eyes are on the legislature in Nashville, the legislators are filing in. The legislatures who oppose suffrage are wearing red roses. Those who support suffrage are, are wearing yellow roses. It looks very close, and it doesn't look all that good. And as the vote is counted, a messenger arrives into the chamber and delivers to um, Harry Byrne, the youngest member of the Tennessee legislature, a letter from his mom. And he opens the letter. Oh, I forgot to mention an important point here. Harry is wearing a red rose, meaning he is going to vote against ratification of the 19th Amendment. He opens his letter from his mother, and the letter says words to these effect. Harry, be a good guy. Be a good boy. Put the rat in ratification for Mrs. Cat. Vote for the amendment. So Harry changes his intention, and when the vote comes to him, even though he's wearing a red rose, he votes for it, and the amendment passes, and uh, the amendment passes in the Tennessee legislature, and the amendment reaches the the three quarters of the state's um, threshold needed for it to become the, the law of the land. I believe this is August 20th of 1920, and six days later. Um, it is signed into, into law and becomes what the guarantee that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had written in uh, 42 years earlier. So we've walked through the first wave of the women's suffrage movement beginning in 1848 in the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention uh, through the end of the, 20, the 19th century, led by women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Uh, Lucy Stone, whom we've mentioned, and many others who are who are not mentioned in this this quick overview. Um, and just you know, it's interesting little footnote here that that I forgot to tell you that at the toward the end of the 19th century, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was lit, living in Tenafly, New Jersey, and she was joined there by Susan B. Anthony and a woman named Gage, and they began to write the history of the women's suffrage movement. So, of course, as the authors of the history of the women's suffrage movement, they play prominently a leading role in that history. It eventually became a six-volume tome that um, was finished by others, but there are historians who say that uh, Chapman and, and Anthony have a disproportionate 
place in the public imagination because of the way that that history de depicts the story of suffrage. I think they certainly did enough to earn their iconic status. So anyway, there, we've gone through the first wave of the women's uh, suffrage movement beginning in 1848 and, and winding up around the turn of the century, and then the passing of the baton to a next generation and the work of um, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul to bring the amendment over the finish line in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, this part of the exhibit is kind of the red rose part of the exhibit. If you'll remember, the red rose was the symbol that uh, was adopted by those who opposed suffrage. And there were a lot of them, uh, and a lot of them were women. So it's very interesting that perhaps the only social justice movement in our history uh, it, it, that, that suffrage was the only social justice movement in our history where the beneficiaries of the movement were also some of the strongest opponents of the movement. Uh, again, it, it harks back to this idea that there was a, a natural order of things as society saw it at the time, and that giving women the vote and, and opening the door to the political realm was disrupting that in such a fundamental way that they felt that the very fam family and the fabric of society itself were being threatened. So who were these people in general and how were they funded? You'll see on the, on the exhibit um, some alcoholic beverages here. And I had mentioned temperance earlier on that many of the suffragists were also uh, active and leaders in the temperance movement. And the liquor industry, the alcohol industry, recognized that if women were enfranchised, many of those new voters would be uh, pro-temperance uh, and pro-prohibition. And uh, so for that reason, they were very willing and eager to fund any anti-suffrage uh, propaganda and movements that, that, that were available to them. Um, other, there were other people who were organized. The political parties were organized in, in opposition to suffrage. Many of the industrialists were. They feared that women voters would support reform to labor laws uh, and address such things as child labor and sweatshops and, and, and other injustices that they felt women would be more likely to remedy than the male voters who, who had not done much of anything to date. So you'll see that there were a lot of, a lot of um, uh, mocking images, cartoons. The newspapers were full of, of cartoons making fun of women who were suffragists as, as being, taking over the male domain, women who supported, men who supported suffrage as staying home and washing and, and doing things that were traditionally women's jobs. If you remember, the name of our exhibit is Votes for Women, New Jersey and beyond. And we haven't talked much about New Jersey other than to mention that Alice Paul is a native New Jersey-born leader of the movement. So let's, let's take a moment here and this, to, to examine this part of the exhibit, which focuses in on New Jersey. And New Jersey has a very interesting and important distinction. It was the first state to allow women to vote. As a matter of fact, being first means going all the way back to actually before the birth of our nation. In 1776, before we declared independence, the um, founders encouraged the states to begin to draft their own state constitutions to be ready for the Declaration of Independence, and New Jersey did. So in 1776, it drafted the New Jersey state Constitution, and in it, it said that all inhabitants of the state of New Jersey who had met the residency requirement and had at least 50 pounds of property, worth of property, could vote. It makes no mention of sex. It makes no mention of, of race. And so New Jersey at that time would permit women and African Americans to vote. And it remained that way until 1807, when the New Jersey legislature 
concerned about some of the voting proclivities of women, in other words, the, their tendency or likelihood to vote in a way that did not favor those in power, decided to rescind that, clarify what they were sure that the uh, original drafters of the Constitution intended, at least in their minds, and uh, clarified that it meant white males could vote with the, with the proper uh, property and, and uh, residency requirements. So we were the first until we weren't. Uh, and, and there is a good historical argument against that logic that it was not the intention of the, of the drafters of the New Jersey Constitution, because later in uh, the late 18th century, there was a change that said that referred to both he and she in terms of discussing voting. So they were explicit about their intention that women should be given the right to vote. If you remember, we discussed a two-prong after the Supreme Court shut down the minor case, we discussed a two-prong strategy for gaining votes for women. One, a state-by-state, -state, state constitutional amendment campaign, and the other, uh, work to get a federal amendment, a change to the U.S. Constitution. So New Jersey was caught up and had uh, actively worked for a change to the New Jersey Constitution. In 1915, four states, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey held elections with referenda that put the question to the voters, should the New Jersey and the other states uh, constitutions be changed to allow women to vote. The New Jersey Vote for Women's uh, Suffrage Referendum was uh, October 19th, 1915. It was defeated. It was, in fact, defeated in all four of these states. Um, in New Jersey, Ocean County was the only county that voted yes. And in Monmouth County, I just happened to look at Ocean Township, since we are the Ocean Township Historical Museum, and the vote was almost two to one against ratification or against passage of a votes for women referendum. Um, I wanted to just point out to you that we talked about Virginia Minor voting, we talked about Susan B. Anthony voting, and in Vineland, New Jersey, in 1868, um, 172 women put together an old cranberry cart, fashioned it into a ballot box, wrote women on it, took it into the polling place, and cast their votes in the election, knowing, of course, that they would be discounted. But again, at least getting some public publicity uh, and coverage of their uh, stand and their, and their commitment to voting. Um, this little covered wagon is meant to recall the story of four suffragists who left from Newark in 1915 on a town-by-town -town campaign. They spoke from the back of the covered wagon. I mean, there were no covered wagons in New Jersey in 1915, so this is definitely a publicity, uh, a publicity gimmick, I guess we would say. And the, the, they spoke and gave speeches all around the state, including in Asbury and Belmar and in local communities here. We have a picture of James Bradley, the founder of Asbury Park, who founded Asbury Park as a dry city, meaning he prohibited alcohol. So he, all his life, was a staunch opponent of drinking. And because the um, anti-suffrage movement was so well-funded by the liquor industry, he, at least in part for that reason, perhaps also because he did believe in, in suffrage for women, uh, put his money and his prestige and his voice behind suffrage for women. Uh, just as a footnote to those four states that had referenda in 1915, uh, New York reintroduced re the referendum to its voters in 1917, and it was passed. So by 1920, when the federal amendment was passed, New York women already had universal suffrage. The exhibit so far has been set in context and giving the broad stroke story of the fight for, for votes for women. Uh, and the rest of the exhibit, starting here, tells, tells a little vignette for each of six prominent suffragists, starting with that woman who, with uh, Lucretia Mott, 
uh, organized the 1848 Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I love it because when you look at Elizabeth, you see the face of this sweet grandmother, mother of seven children, and it belies what lies underneath, which is a feisty, uh, take no prisoners fighter and demander of rights. Remember, she was the one at that convention that insisted suffrage be included when her fellow organizers, her husbands, and all others, with the possible except, with, with the exception of Frederick Douglass and possibly a few others, wanted no part of suffrage as too radical idea. This is a radical grandmother, uh, despite her sweet and innocent looks. Um, the the um, exhibit tells her story showing a piece of uh, vintage children's clothing, because she was the mother of seven, and also a Bible, because this is a fascinating insight into her. She decided toward the end of the 19th century to rewrite several books of the Bible and eliminate from them their sexist language. So it was called the Women's Bible. It was very controversial, so controversial that it threatened the credibility of the movement and the other prominent leaders of the suffrage movement kind of asked Elizabeth to fade from the limelight a bit because she was just drawing too much fire on an issue that was not central to the cause. We move on to Susan B. Anthony. These two women were dear friends and uh, they were partner, political partners who fought for all of their lives for the right for women to vote and for other causes such as suffrage and women's rights in general. And as we said, Anthony is the iconic leader of the movement. Anthony took for a while in, in the early, uh, in the 1860s, I believe it was. And Susan B. Anthony for a while took to wearing bloomers, which was a fashion, uh, was a radical fashion idea that was introduced in the mid 1840s. And it isn't just a trivial thing that the bloomers were a fashion statement by the suffragists, because when you think about it, if you think about women's attire through history. They are a surrogate for understanding how women are being treated by society. And if you think about the, 18th, the 19th century, you think of corseted women who are wearing large hoop skirts and bustles and other things that are constraining to their freedom and their movement and certainly taking their breath away, literally. And so metaphorically also their voice. So wearing bloomers was a statement of freedom. Unfortunately, the bloomer attracted such ridicule by the public and by the press that most suffragists just abandoned doing it because it, again, drained energy from the main purpose and, and the main idea for which they were fighting. Toward the end of the 19th century, bloomers again came back, and this time they were more successful in taking hold because it was also the time of the uh, bicycle craze, and obviously a hoop skirt isn't going to do it on a bicycle. Next we have Lucy Stone. We've mentioned Lucy before because she uh, split with Anthony and um, Stanton over the 15th Amendment, and she and her organization uh, continued to support universal suffrage and fought for the ratification of the 15th Amendment. It's an interesting side story here that Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony were friends and had promised as young women that neither would marry, given the conditions for married women in the 19th century. Susan B. Anthony was true to that oath. Lucy Stone was pursued by Henry Blackwell, who was a progressive abolitionist, women's rights man, who convinced her that she could marry and he would honor her and preserve, to the extent that he could, her, her privileges and rights as a human being and as a citizen. So they did marry, and that caused a strain in the friendship between Anthony and Stone. But here's the interesting part of that story. When they married, they edited the wedding vows, took out the word obey, but added a whole bunch of demands for women. And Lucy Stone refused to take Blackwell's name and is known in, to history and throughout her life as Lucy Stone. And to this day, women who refuse to take uh, their husband's name when they marry are called Lucy Stoners. Another interesting side note here is that Henry Blackwell's sister Elizabeth 
actually both of his sisters were physicians and his sister Elizabeth was the first woman in this country to uh, earn her degree as a doctor in 1849. We've already introduced Ida B. Wells, a noted suffragist and also a distinguished publisher, lecturer, and uh, internationally acknowledged crusader against lynching. Uh, Ida B. Wells was born just months before Abraham Lincoln issued the Pro uh, Emancipation Proclamation, so she was technically born a slave. She was well-educated. Um, she taught for a while to support her siblings after both of her parents died of yellow fever. When three of her friends, African-American uh, businessmen, were lynched for the crime of having successful businesses in competition with, with white rivals, uh, she took up that cause and wrote prolifically and effectively and lectured around the globe as an anti-lynching crusader. Um, she started several organizations for African-American suffragists and just for African-American women in general. At that time, the church and sororities and women's clubs were breeding grounds for women for to learn and hone their leadership skills. And this was the case for African-American women as well. And Ida B. Wells was uh, a champion and a crusader in the movement of African-American women's clubs and sororities and uh, spoke eloquently and powerfully for their cause, not just for suffrage. I mean, African-American women had a dual burden, their blackness and their womanhood. And so all of her, Ida's work and, and, and that of many of her fellow African-American suffragists were never exclusively focused on suffrage because they had other important fish to fry at the same time. We've already met Carrie Chapman Catt, Susan B. Anthony's hand-picked successor to the National Suffrage Organization toward the end of the 19th century. Uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, like most of the women that we've talked about, was highly intelligent, a brilliant strategist, um, and in, an intensely devoted and committed champion for, for causes and that cause ultimately became suffrage, and she worked to the end to bring the suffrage movement to uh, successful fruition in 1920. She had an organization that is claimed to have had two million people working for the cause of suffrage across the country. By contrast, I think that uh, Alice Paul's organization had fewer than 100,000. So even though Alice Paul was capturing many of the headlines, it was uh, Carrie Chapman Katz organization that was doing the groundwork, uh, pursuing and tracking down the politicians in Nashville, not letting them get into the uh, shooting range of the anti-suffragists who were filling them with, with arguments against ratification. So she, she was really known to be brilliantly skilled in, in, in her ability to organize and uh, to motivate uh, women and men across the country for the cause. And when she shut down the suffrage cause during the war, she put all of those formidable powers uh, into supporting the war effort. Hence, we have the World War I uniform here to make that connection more explicit. And finally, we end our tour with Alice Paul, who uh, died in 1977. And when the successful uh, campaign for the vote was culminated in 1920, did not stop her efforts to fight for women, and was the author of the Equal Rights Amendment, which she campaigned for passionately until the end of her life. On our exhibit table, we have pictures of the Pankhurst, of Emmeline Pankhurst, her mentor in London, who taught her heretical methods that she was legendary for here. There's a, a tiny pin that uh, Alice Paul had made and she awarded to all of her um, suffragists and her organization who had spent time in jail. She put those women in uh, prison garb with wearing their pins on a train, which she called the prison train, and sent them on a campaign around the country giving speeches out of the back of the train to convince people in the ratification run-up 
to um, support the, the um, 19th Amendment and influence their legislatures to do so. So that wraps up our virtual tour of the suffrage exhibit in the Richmond Gallery of the Eden Willie House. I hope that there are a few tidbits that have uh, piqued your interest and maybe given you some new insight into the kind of dedication, commitment, and relentless willingness to commit to a cause that the women and men behind the 19th Amendment displayed for the benefit of all of us.